Good morning and welcome to the 5th of September, 2021. Amazing to think that we're already in the ninth month of the year. It seems to have flown by quickly, hasn't it? And as if you've been keeping up with the events around the world, you know that not only Christians, but people everywhere need our prayers and um, the help of those, our government included, who need it. Matthew 22 verses 1 through 14 is our passage for this morning and it is an invitation for all of us here in church and for those watching the video today. There is a wedding feast that you are invited to. Jesus spoke to them again in parables and he said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, but they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other servants and he said, tell those who have been invited, behold, I prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted livestock are butchered. Everything's ready, come to the wedding feast. A second invitation went out, but they paid no attention. They went their way one to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, mistreated, and killed them. This is essentially the story of God sending his prophets to his people through the centuries, and too many of them ignoring what the prophets had to say. There's an invitation that God gives. Twice he sent them. Actually, throughout Israel's history, many times he sent prophets. Then they began mistreating those prophets and eventually killed some. Eventually he would send his son and they would do the same to him. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his servants, the wedding's ready, it's prepared but those who were invited were not worthy. It wasn't that they were not worthy in themselves because none of us are worthy to make it into heaven. Jesus is the one who makes us worthy through his death. But the worthiness is simply because they refused, rejected. So he said, the feast is ready. I want people to come to the wedding feast. So go out into the highways and the byways and find as many as you can and invite them to the wedding feast. So the servants went out in the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. Do you know the thief on the cross dying next to Jesus said he deserved it, but Jesus didn't. He knew he deserved what he was getting, but he's in heaven today. None of us deserve to get there, but Jesus died this morning is Communion Sunday and we celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So it doesn't matter, good and evil are all invited, he said. And the wedding hall was filled with his dinner guests. So there was a time when the king came in to look over the wedding guests and he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And this is what he said to him, friend. He calls him friend to start with. How is it, how'd you come in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. He had been discovered. And the king said to his servants, bind him hand and feet and throw him into the outer darkness. In the outer darkness, that is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he concludes this and said, many are called, but few chosen. What's meant by that? So many people are called to the feast. So people will choose, so few will choose and thus be what you might call chosen by God. Obviously, we're chosen in Christ, but the chosen in Christ also depends upon us choosing Jesus. So many are called, but unfortunately, not all respond and say, yes, this is the story of that happening. Father, may you bless this passage to our hearts and minds and impress your lesson on us this morning in Jesus' name. When Jesus told this parable, he was not unfamiliar with the story of the parable because 
In John chapter 2, John writes and says that there was a wedding in Cana. And Mary had been invited, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. They accepted the invitation and made their way to the wedding. The, John goes on to say that this wedding had lacked wine at the end of the feast. And so Mary came to Jesus and told him about the lack of wine. And his first response was, well, woman, what does that have to do with you and me? And she, full of faith, knows that he is capable and able and willing to do something. So she does not tell him what to do. No one tells God what to do. But she knows he is compassionate, caring, is capable and able and willing, so she simply turns to the people around him and she says to them, whatever he tells you to do, you just go do it. So he instructs them. There's some large water pots, says fill up the water pots, and then tells one of them, draw out some and go take it to the head waiter. And the head waiter tastes some of it and is amazed at the quality. This is the best. Why did you save the best till last? Well, Jesus always makes the best of everything. Why did you save the best till last? Well, the host had run out. The story today is going to tell us that the host never runs out. There's an invitation and he has so much that he invites everyone. Matter of fact, those who had refused to come left a lot of room for everyone else. So he told the servants, I don't want it like this. I'm unwilling to have my house not go filled. So go out to the highways and byways. I don't care who you find. I don't care what condition they're in. Invite them in. I want my house filled. His intention is to fill heaven with people forever. At the time that Jesus lived in that land, there were people of wealth who would put together a large feast and invite a lot of people to come. That day would be set, they would know, but they wouldn't know exactly the time because the preparations would take a while to get ready. But they know the feast was coming and they'd set it aside. So what they were waiting for was simply the servants of the host to come by the house, knock on the door and say, it's all set, food's on the table, everything's ready, come on. As you come, stop by through the door and our host has provided a wedding garment for everyone. It's all they were waiting for. In simple terms, the Bible tells us this parable means, in simple terms, the host that invites is God the Father. The wedding feast is being prepared for his son. The bride that's being prepared is everyone who will come and be a part of that wedding feast. The book of Revelation talks to us about the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that's what this is referring to. Whosoever will may come, anyone can. The call goes out to everyone, but the answer, yes, is not made by everyone. Some who are called by his gracious offer refuse. I want you to see in this story that there is nothing for the guest to do except to come. He tells his servants, get the place ready. He tells his servants, get the food ready. He tells his servants, set everything up. He tells his servants, I've got some wonderful, beautiful wedding garments. Put them out by the front door. And whoever comes in, everybody who walks in through that door, clothe them with this beautiful wedding garment and get them a place to sit. I want to celebrate a wedding feast with them. There's nothing anyone needed to add to what he's doing. The place was secured, paid for, the food and refreshments provided, the garments. At most modern wedding, we all dress up a bit, but the wedding party really dresses up. The bride is beautiful on that day, adorned like no one else. I remember my bride on that day. I stood at an altar just like this, the doors in the back were closed, and suddenly the doors opened up and the wedding march, I think, I don't I think that's the name of Don, da, 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 kind of went like that. Don't get me to sing it because I can't. 
And the door swung open and there she was. Just stunning. And her dad walked her down the aisle and gave her hand to me. And we turned and faced the pastor. But before we began our ceremony, each of us stopped as the pastor led us to commit ourselves to Jesus again, personally, individually, and then the two of us, Lynn and I, together, recognizing that's what our marriage is based on. I first gave my life to Christ, she gives her life to Christ, and then we give our life together to Christ. That was Pastor Bibler, by the way. So the garments were provided, not just for the groom, the groomsmen, but for everyone coming. There was no expense spared by the host, but some who were invited refused. The Bible teaches us about this wedding garment. It's provided for everyone. The New Testament tells us that that covering is Christ, his righteousness. Paul writes this in Galatians chapter 3 from God's Word translation. Before Christ came, Moses' law served as a tutor or a teacher. But Christ came so that we would receive the gift of eternal life by faith. So I'll just try. All they had to do was believe what the host had to say. You're welcome. Come. Everything's provided for. It's ready. Faith. But now that this faith has come, Paul writes, we're no longer under the control of the law. We are all God's children now by trusting in Christ. So all who are baptized in Christ's name have been clothed with Christ. It's what happened at this wedding feast. The garment took and covered them. And so we as Christians have been covered with the righteousness of Jesus, the whiteness, the purity. So that's what God sees when he sees us. If you ever wonder how God views you, that's the story. God sees the purity of Jesus and his righteousness and not ours. So how does the parable fit into the 21st century? As I started our series on parables, I wanted to tell you every parable fit into the first century. This parable talks about the history of Israel, some responding by faith, some not. Some just living in indifference and apathy, others responding with antagonism. And the story that the king was very unhappy with their response and was unwilling to leave his wedding feast half empty. So he's going to fill it. And so the Bible tells us that God has turned to the Gentile, the non-Jewish world, which is me, and made the same invitation. And to you, because he said, I want my feast filled. God wants heaven filled. But the Bible says they would not come. They would not come. They had no desire to enter the feast. Verse 5 says they paid no attention, went their way. One went to his farm, another one went to his business. And the rest, they seized the servants and mistreated and killed them. They didn't care, paid no attention, didn't listen. They allowed property, businesses, and possessions to get in the way, simply attending a wedding feast. There's another group of people who went far beyond ignoring the invitation. They actively opposed the king and his servants and went so far as to mistreat and kill them. Two words describe these responses, apathy and antagonism. The first one is apathy or indifference, just don't care. That marks most people who heard the gospel. It marked my life for a few years. As I had heard it shared with me, I just was enjoying my life too much to pay any attention to it until God grabs your attention, which he's really good at doing. You'll find out that you're really unsatisfied with what you've got. You don't like where your life is headed, or you found that as um, Ira Stanfield, who wrote Mansion Over the Hilltop, discovered that your business, he heard from a businessman, can go upside down, crater. And though he lost everything in this world, 
he was reminded by God that we have a mansion over the hilltop waiting for us and a savior who's coming back again to receive us unto himself. And that's what encouraged him. So when that person who spends all of their time ignoring the call to the wedding feast, but instead spends all their time and effort on possessions and business and everything that they're involved in, what happens? When they pass away, all those things will go to someone else. No one takes that with them. This is the I'm too busy for anything spiritual excuse. But these people forget when they die, someone will sit down and divide up everything that they leave. Their activities in comparison to eternal life will be shown to be a waste of time. They will have traded their life, this most valuable, precious life that God gives all of us, and the wonderful, gracious invitation to join him at the wedding feast that they have rejected. They'll see that they traded their soul away for the much better and they gave it, they gave away the permanent for the temporary. That's what people do who ignore the call to the wedding feast. The other group, they're antagonistic. Antagonism to religion in general and Christianity in particular has been growing in our country for decades. It's been slow, but it's more noticeable now than ever before. For the first time in American history, as far as what you might call pollsters or people who kind of check the temperature of Americans, for the first time in the last few years, there are now fewer people going to church, synagogues, weekend service of some sort than ever before in our history. The group of nuns, that's N-O-N-E-S, none, the ones who claim no religion at all, are growing and now are more than half of the population of the United States. They actually are the larger part of the millennials. However, the good news is that there is an awakening happening among the millennials, and I'm so glad to see it. I don't care if they pass us old guys by. I hope they do. I hope they build churches everywhere. The antagonism. Let me give you a couple of stories. The first one is from msn.com, which by the way is not a religious website by any means. This article from August 27th of this year, the title grabbed my attention. Harvard University elects an atheist as a head chaplain. I couldn't believe when I saw that. So here's the story. America's prestigious, it's their language, Harvard University followed, I'm sorry, founded by Puritans, actually Congregationalists, over 400 years ago, has a new chief chaplain, and he doesn't believe in God. Harvard was founded in 1636 to train Protestant clergy that was its intention. Matter of fact, the majority of what we call the Ivy League schools were started to train clergy. They added to those studies as the colleges grew into university status, but that's how they began. And now they've elected as their head chaplain, an atheist. Greg Epstein is his name, age 44, took up the role this week, becoming the first atheist elected president of Harvard's organization of chaplains. Epstein has been Harvard's humanist chaplain since 2005 and is now the author of best-selling book. This is his title, Good Without God. I don't know how you can have that. Look at the world without God and without Christ. But that's his title, Good Without God. What a billion non-religious people do believe. The story of the people in the wedding feast is probably just that. The host invites them and they thought, I can have a good life without needing to respond to the host giving the wedding feast. And so they put all their efforts into temporary 
businesses and possessions and activities and suddenly discovered that one day their life was over and an accounting was going to be given and they would leave everything behind. Good without God is an oxymoron. It means it just doesn't make sense. It's like saying square is round. It can't exist. What a billion non-religious people do believe. I'm obliged and honored, he wrote on Twitter. We don't look to a God for answers. We are each other's answers, he added. Next, from CBNnews.com, which is a Christian website. There is woke curriculum now making its way through our California schools. Are you shocked? Here's the story. The California Department of Education passed curriculum that has students praying to Aztec gods. According to a lawsuit filed by the Thomas More Society, the prayers, according to the National Nonprofit Public Interest Law Firm, are being taught under the guise of ethnic studies curriculum. In other words, they hide this under ethnic studies curriculum, saying we're going to study these ethnic groups and thus study their deities. And then they bring this material in. A lawsuit was filed in California Superior Court on behalf of taxpayers and parents of children in school. It came after the state superintendent of public instruction chose not to answer a letter with legal demands. They sent him a letter with legal demands that this material, religious in nature, be pulled from the curriculum, and he did not answer it. Why did he not answer it? Why did the people not answer the invitation to the wedding feast? They didn't like the host. The letter asked this state's top educational authority to withdraw the Aztec prayer from the curriculum. The lawsuit detailed the state's Board of Education approved ethnic studies model curriculum, which includes a section of, quote, affirmations, chants, and energizers. Although labeled as affirmation, it addresses the deities both by name and their traditional titles, recognizes them as sources of power and knowledge, invokes their assistance, and gives thanks to them. In short, the complaint points out it is a state-mandated curricular prayer. One of the people bringing the suit explained, can you imagine if the elements of Christian faith were proposed to be included in public school curriculum Oh, they dealt with that several decades ago and removed prayer from schools in 1962, at least beginning at that point. And now what they discover is the students are free, for instance, at the end of a football game, the students, they make their way out to the middle of the field and they'll take a knee and thank God for that. They're allowed to, but may God help the coach who goes out with them lest he be fired for taking a knee with the students, though it's student-led. So what if a class incorporated the Lord's Prayer as part of an ethnic studies curriculum about Western Europe, or a prayer from the Old Testament about an ethnic studies curriculum about Jewish history? Would that be approved? I wouldn't bet on it. So do you wonder then how will the antagonistic people get in power in such a way as not only will they put all this into curriculum and into society in general, how will they do it? Well, folks, it's happening today, not just by way of the State Department of Education. Let me bring you a final story from Australia. The Bible says that there were the two groups of people the apathetic, indifferent, we're too busy, we don't care, we like what we're doing, what you're asking us to do, we can't even, don't want any part of it, don't say, and then there's the other antagonistic group that beat and killed the servants sent to bring the message. In August 2020, that's about a year ago, the courts in Australia disallowed the police 
from using facial recognition software apps in phones. In other words, there are some phones that you can buy that have facial recognition software. You just smile into it and it will unlock your phone for you. Some use a thumbprint. Well, that capacity, the courts disallowed the police to be able to use in August of 2020, about a year ago. However, that's now changed. Quote, a South Australian government launched a new at-home quarantine policy last week for citizens to download an app with facial recognition software and geolocation software to prove they are following a two-week mandatory quarantine or face a police response. So let me just explain that pretty simply. They're going to make you put on your phone an app that you will start and it will start your camera and it will take a snapshot of you and that snapshot will have a GPS, a geolocation attached to it that they can tell exactly where you were when that app took your picture and that's sent to the authorities. Do you understand that? So what they're saying at the moment is that travelers who face this two week quarantine can stay at home instead of a hotel if they wish. This was developed by the South Australian government to qualify for home quarantine. Individuals must prove first they have a place, a home to isolate and must also be fully vaccinated. Using geolocation and facial recognition, the app tracks users by randomly selecting them, contacting them, and asking them to provide proof of their location within 15 minutes. If they fail to provide that within 15 minutes, then the police are notified and they will respond. If a resident cannot prove his, her location or identity, the South Australian Health Department will contact law enforcement and they will go subsequently verify in person that the individual is where they were supposed to be in the first place. Marshall, one of the authorities said, quote, none of the information provided in the app will be stored by the government. Do citizens actually believe that? He hopes that the national trial will be applied to international travelers in subsequent weeks. So they can only enforce it within their borders, but they can enforce it to anyone flying into Australia. He said this, we just use it to verify that people are where they said they were when they're going to be during their home base quarantine. That's all. And we don't store the information. Welcome to the new world order. As they say on the left, never let a crisis go to waste. Those people in power are using every ounce of anything that they can marshal together to put together as much control of the population, not only in Australia and not only in the United States, but around the world. The day is not just coming. George Orwell's 1984 is now. These are all indications, listen to me, that human beings are going to insist on running the world as they wish, irregardless of how God intended this world, his world, to run. They have no intention to ask God for directions, commands, nor to pray, nor to help, nor to seek any guidance. They want nothing to do with God and they want nothing to do with his invitation to a wonderful, joyful, gracious, eternal wedding feast. 
They are going to take it all and run it themselves. So what about that last man now? So the Bible says in this parable, the invitation went out. They didn't respond. Send another servant. Go tell them. It's ready. And they all refused. Some were apathetic, we read, more interested in their businesses and farms and possessions and activities. They thought that this life was more important than the next, and it's not. The next is more important than this one. And the choices we make will determine where we spend eternity. Then there was another group that were antagonistic. They beat the first group of servants, beat some more eventually. So many servants were sent that they figured the only way to get rid of this is to kill them. Finally, God said, I will send my son and he'll tell them about the feast. And they put him to death also, figuring that when they put him to death, they finished it. But they were wrong. On the third day, he rose out of the grave into new life and promised, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I will come back again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. But there's a last man now in the parable. He had decided to attend the wedding feast, but there's a problem. The host goes around to greet everyone. I'm sure to ask them how they're doing, as any host would. How's the food? Are you enjoying it? It's wonderful to see you. So glad you're here. And then he finds somebody without a wedding garment on. And he walks up to him and he calls him friend, doesn't he? You know, when Judas came to portray Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had told the soldiers, the one that I kiss is the one that you want. So as Judas came up to give him a greeting, very common in those days, a kiss on the side of the cheek, it was a sign of being a friend. But he wasn't. But in spite of that, Jesus says this, friend, you betray me with a kiss? Those things can't exist together. How can you be a friend and betray me? How can you kiss me with what you're doing and then turn me over? But he called him friend because the heart of God is always good even to those who do him evil. He doesn't have a garment on. And so what happens to him? He's removed from the feast. It seems odd. Why would you think this man would be removed? Wouldn't it be simple that he would just be told, well, go back out and find yourself a garment? Got to be a lot left. Grab one. But there's a reason why. Remember, the garments were freely provided, so he could have had one. How does he make it into the wedding feast without getting a garment? I wondered that. See, the host calls him friend, and then he says, how'd you get in here without wedding clothes? Everyone invited would have needed to come through the front door. No reason to come to the back door. We're all welcome through the pearly gates, God says. No one climbs over the wall. No one goes into the second story window and comes down from upstairs and makes the way into the feast. Everyone goes through the one who says, I am the door, I am the way. That's it. There isn't a second or third way into the feast. There's one way. And that one way is through the front, through Christ. And as we pass in through him through that way provided by him were given a garment everybody who passes that way see there's one opening to the sheepfold not two or three it's the wolf that tries to climb over how is it this man decided he wasn't going to enter the wedding feast the proper way he just decided he wasn't going in the right way he could have and he decided not to that's his fault, not the host's fault. He calls him friend. How'd you get in here? You must have come some other way than the appointed way. And so since you came the way that's not appointed and you came without a garment, then you must have chosen not to. 
And since you have chosen not to, I'm going to honor your choice not to. That is the most fearsome thing I can think of, that a human being will choose to say no to God, and in the end, God will honor their choice and not force them to enter his wedding feast. People think, well, you know, I'll just stand in front of him and give him some good reasons someday why he ought to let me in. And that's not how it works. Even still, he had called him friend. So throughout, God is good and gracious. It's man's fault. The lack of his proper garment showed he climbed in the wrong way, and he purposely rejected the host's provision for him. He rejected it. He must have seen that everyone else had on something he didn't have. He just said no. He set up the rules the way he wanted to, as did the antagonistic and did the apathetic. And that's not how the universe works. God has set up the rules, and we either live by them or we will die. So when we are all invited to a wonderful, eternal wedding feast with a gracious host who has provided everything that's needed, why not just say yes? Those who don't want anything to do with God in their life will have that choice granted in eternity. Why not instead choose Christ, choose that entryway, have the garment provided, and enjoy the blessings of the eternal wedding feast? Why not? How could you say no? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. The invitation still goes out, Lord. It goes out by this video, by every church around the world that preaches Jesus Christ and salvation through him. I pray that those who are apathetic and indifferent would see what's happening around us and wake up. And God, I know that those are our antagonistic, Lord. They will not just persecute the church, but put to death your servants that are sent to remind them of the invitation but they did that to Jesus. So we can expect, Lord, blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake, Jesus said, and for the gospel's sake, for great is our reward in heaven. Lord, we will live for you and share the gospel till Jesus comes back again. In Christ's name, amen.